All right, everybody, welcome to Math with Grace. All right, today we're going to be going over geometry books 104 and 105. We're going to be finishing the end of section 4 in book 104, pages 83 to 89. And book 105, we're going to begin section 1, pages 2 through 9. Beginning in book 104, starting at the bottom of page 83, we're going to now be looking at three special parallelograms, a rectangle, a rhombus, and a square. Okay, these are each parallelograms, and we're going to be looking at their special procedures or special parts here. A rectangle is a parallelogram with one right angle. And we know with parallelograms that um, opposite angles are equal. So if it has one right angle, then that means this is a right angle. We also know that adjacent sides are supplementary. So if this is a right angle, then this is a right angle. If this is a right angle, its opposite is a right angle. So technically a rectangle has four right angles, but this is the basis of the definition. Now, a rhombus is a parallelogram with all sides equal. If you're not sure you know what a rhombus is, think about a square that got squished off to one side. So it doesn't have right angles, but all of its sides are equal. And then a square is a par parallelogram with all sides equal and one right angle. So a square is kind of a combination of a rectangle and a rhombus. Turning the page to page 84, we get some theorems now based on our definitions. Theorem 420, the diagonals of a rectangle are equal. So if we have a rectangle, this is saying that these diagonals are equal. They're of equal length. 421 tells us that the diagonals of a rhombus are perpendicular. Now remember I told you a rhombus is like a squished square and my drawing skills are horrible. But they're saying that the diagonals of a rhombus are perpendicular to each other. Okay? And then theorem 422, each diagonal of a rhombus bisects two angles of the rhombus. So when we have a rhombus again, and it makes a diagonal, that diagonal bisects the two angles. Bisect, remember, means to break something in half. All right, and so that leads us into a bunch of proofs. What I want you to notice on the proofs for the rest of this book, I'm pretty sure all of them, they do not give you the proof, the given statement or the prove statement. Um, I will be giving you that information. I don't think it's time in our proof solving skills to try to decipher what we're trying to prove and what our given information is. So I will be providing that to you on this video as a link that you can print out and then you can write in to, for all your proofs what the given and the proof is, all right? Um, but there is a proof that I wanna do, so let's take a look at that. All right, so the proof that I'd like to look at is on page 85 of section four in book 1004. It's proof 441, and this is the uh, image that we're given. And again, the given and the proofs are all empty, but you go ahead and write this in. Our given is that DCBA is a rhombus, and they want us to prove that AC is perpendicular to BD. All right, now when you're looking at this drawing, I want you to notice they've got one, two, and what looks like a zero, but this O is actually the, the point right here. This is point O, not angle zero. Okay, this is angle one, that's angle two, but this is point zero, point oh, which is right there in the middle. All right, so now that you've written down your given and your proof into the sp space provided, let's solve this proof, okay? Number one, what is our number one always, right? DCBA is a rhombus. Why do we know that that's true? Because it is given information, okay? I gave it to you, it is given information. Okay, done. We're going to use that now. What do we know about rhombuses? We need to prove that DB and AC are perpendicular to each other. To do that, we need to show that angle one is equal to angle two, right? Because if we do that, if we can show that angle one is equal to angle two, because they are supplementary angles, that would mean that them being equal would mean that they're both 90 degrees. If they're both a 90 degree angle, then we can say 
that these are perpendicular lines because these two couldn't be equal unless these were perpendicular, right? Okay, so that's our goal, to show that these are equal. To do that, we need some congruent triangles, right? Well, here's a triangle and here's a triangle, AOD, AOB. We need to show that these triangles are congruent. So that's where we need to lean. So we know that a rhombus has its exterior sides. All of its sides are equal, right? We just talked about that with our rhombus. So that's going to be our next step. Number two, AD is equal to AB. And why do we know that that's true? Because all sides of a rhombus are equal, right? We just talked about that's the definition basically of a rhombus. All sides of a rhombus are equal. So now we've shown that AD is equal to AB. Okay, we can mark it as such. Our next step now is to try to find another side. We, we know that we can say that AO is equal to AO, right? They share that. So that's two sides. We can't really talk about any of the angles per se. So what we want to aim for, since we have one side, we know we can get a second side. Can we get a third side? Well, we can. So we can use our side, side, side. That's where our goal is going to be. And we can do that because we can say that DO is equal to OB because that diagonals of a parallelogram bisect each other. Remember when we talked about that last week? That's theorem 415, right? That the diagonals of a parallelogram bisect each other. We know that a rhombus is a parallelogram. So we can say that the diagonals of a parallelogram, parallelogram bisect each other. Okay, we know that that's true. That was from last week, theorem 415. Please have your theorem and postulates page available to you while you're working so that you can look at all of your options. We've shown that these are equal, so I'm gonna mark them as such, right? Now, like I talked about before, let's get that third side, right? We've got side, side, we just need one more side and we're good. So we can say that AO is equal to AO. And why is AO equal to AO? Because it's reflexive. It is itself, so it is reflexive. Doop, doop, doop. Now when we're walking around these triangles, we have side, side, side. So we can state now that triangle AOD is congruent to triangle, remember we gotta match up our parts, AOB because side, side, side. That's what we just showed, okay? We were given that we had a rhombus, therefore we have a parallelogram. We were given, we know that all sides of a rhombus are equal, so we got our exterior side here equal to each other. We can show that DO is equal to OB because the diagonals of a parallelogram bisect each other. Technically, AO is equal to OC as well, but we don't need that bit of information. Then we can say that AO is equal to itself. It's a reflexive thing, right? Everything is equal. You're equal to yourself. I'm equal to myself. AO is equal to AO. It's reflexive, right? Then we had our side, side, side. So we could say that our triangles are congruent. Now that we have our triangles congruent, we can state that angle one is equal to angle two. And why can we say that that's true? We have congruent triangles, and so now we can use our favorite reason, my favorite reason, CPCTE. Corresponding parts, and one in angle one and angle two definitely correspond, of congruent triangles, we just showed we had congruent triangles, are equal. Angle one is equal to angle two. I kind of messed that up, but that's okay. All right, angle one is equal to angle two. Boom, that leads us to our proof that AC is perpendicular to BD because that is the definition of perpendicular lines, okay? If, when a line comes 
and it hits another line and the two angles created are equal, that is a perpendicular line. That is the definition of a perpendicular line. Okay, those are the steps. Write them into your book. We just solved proof 41. Let's take a look at another one. All right, the next one I wanted to do was number 445 and it's on page 87. Here is the illustration that we're given and it's asking us, well, I'm asking us, giving us the information of that A, B, C, D is a rectangle and that points K, point L, point M, and point N are all midpoints around this rectangle, okay? What we are supposed to prove is that KLMN is a parallelogram. This proof is kind of trickety, not because it's different than any other proof, but it uses a theorem that we will rarely use, or at least not very often. Um, so I wanted to do this one with you guys. Number one is always going to be the same, and that's our given information. So A, B, C, D is a rectangle. And we've got point K, point L, point M, and point N, and they are midpoints. And I just abbreviate that M-I-D-P-T-S. All right. And what is the reason that we know that that's true? Because it's our given information. Okay. Two. Well, what does this tell us? Well, the drawing tells us that we need to do another step, right? They've put in a dotted line AC. And that's a step that they want us to take. They've, so they've put that dotted line in there as a note to us. So they want us to draw a C. And what do we call it when we draw an extra line into something? We call it an auxiliary line. Okay, so we are just drawing in an auxiliary line and that line is AC. Now when we draw this line AC, it's creating two triangles, right? It's a diagonal in a rectangle, and it's now created two triangles, triangle ADC and triangle CBA, right? What we're trying to prove is that this shape here in the inside is a parallelogram. There's several different ways that we can do that, but since we've drawn this and we've created now, two triangles this is where it gets tricky and this is why step three has so many lines um look in your book number three has got uh let's see one two three four lines for number three right this is why here is what we're going to say we are going to say that n m is parallel to a c so n m being this line and a c being the line we just drew Okay, here's the triangle that they're part of. And that NM is equal to one half of AC. Do you remember now what theorem that we're leaning towards? We're leaning to that weird triangle run, right? Where if you have a triangle and then you have midpoints of their sides and you connect those midpoints, that connection, that line that you drew is parallel to the third side of the triangle. And it's also one half of that side of the triangle, right? So this is why I'm doing this one with you because it's weird. But not only can we say that about NM, but we can also say that about KL. We can say that KL is oh, not equal to, sorry, is parallel to AC and that KL is equal to one half of AC. And all of those things have the same reason. And that's that um, theorem 419, okay, it's on page 80. If you need to review it, page 80, what am I doing? All right, and it states that connecting the midpoints of two sides of a triangle, okay, so connected, and this is gonna be a long one, mid, I get ahead of myself sometimes, my brain, midpoints of two sides of a triangle, okay, are parallel to the third side. There's no way to shorten this, I'm sorry. And equal to one half the length 
of the third side. Okay, that's what that proof is, right? When we connect the midpoints of two sides of a triangle, and that's what we did here, okay? If you look at just, I got one little piece of paper here. If we look at just this triangle, we've got our midpoints connected. That line that connects them is parallel to the third side of the triangle. It's also equal to one half of that. Well, we turn it around and we look at this other one. We've got the same thing, right? We've got the connected midpoints of two sides of a triangle. That line there makes is parallel to the third side of the triangle, and it's also equal to one half of that length, right? That's why we can say all four of those things in one spot, because we've got two different triangles that we created, so each part has the exact same answer. That's why I'm doing this one with you. It's just really... A weird one. So number four then is what we're going to do is we're going to take this here and this here and we're going to say that NM is equal to KL. And here's why we can say that, right? NM is equal to one half of AC and KL is equal to one half of AC. So I can just substitute this KL for that because it's they're equal to the same thing. So what do we call that? We call it substitution, right? We're just substituting KL for this one half AC because KL is equal to one half AC. They're both equal to each other, so we can substitute it. Now for step five, we're gonna use this part and this part, okay? And I'm gonna say that NM is parallel to KL and you could write substitution here. Um, the book likes to use the word for this, that transitive property, the transitive property saying that if NM is parallel to AC and KL is parallel to AC, then they're parallel to each other because two lines parallel to the same line are parallel to each other, right? We did that a long time ago, that theorem. Um, it's called the transitive property. You could write substitution here because it's basically the same thing. And that leads us now, oh, we'll be marked here. We got those equal. We have them equal and parallel. Remember, that is one of our proofs, right? Or one of our theorems. So number six, we can say that KLMN is a parallelogram. And we can say that that's true because if two sides, oh, I'm at the end of my paper and it's driving me nuts. If two sides are equal and parallel, then the quadrilateral, or in this case, the rectangle, is a parallelogram, okay? Remember, if two sides are equal which we prove them to be equal here, and parallel, which we prove them to be parallel here, then we can say that this is a parallelogram because the two sides equal and parallel, then it's a parallelogram. All right, so I wanted to do this one because I know it's pretty trickety. Um, so go ahead and write this in. Remember, the, um, the list of all your givens and proofs will be attached to this video. So you're gonna to wanna to print that out so that you can finish the rest of your proofs. But for now, let's talk about trapezoids. On page 89, we're gonna start talking about trapezoids. So this is the general shape of a trapezoid. And what's its definition? A trapezoid is a quadrilateral with exactly one pair of parallel sides. So if we look at this image here, we can tell that these pairs are probably the parallel sides because I'm pretty sure those two sides would hit each other if they continued. Same here. This two sides look parallel on this one and then the top and the bottom again. It says the parallel sides of a trapezoid are called the bases. So it, even if this one, these two sides would be called the bases, okay? And the non-parallel sides are called the legs. Leg, 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 okay? The median of a trapezoid, and this is important, is a segment connecting the midpoint of the legs. And so I kind of drew it in here a little bit in like dotty lines. That would be the median of the trapezoid. Here for this one, since it's more vertical, this would be the median, if those were midpoints anyway. Yeah, obviously I'm just guessing, but the median of a trapezoid is a segment connecting the midpoints of the legs. Let's turn the page and see what we got. 
So on the top of page 90, they have a hilariously drawn out picture of a trapezoid and a representation of the median, the bases, the legs, okay? Looks like a piece of taffy that they squished out, right? But it tells us if two legs are the same length, then the figure is called an isosceles trapezoid. So we've got our two bases parallel. If our legs are the same length, then it's called an isosceles trapezoid, right? These are just definitions, names, important things to remember. Okay, and here is a pretty box of definitions. It tells us that the base of a trapezoid are the parallel sides. The legs of the trapezoids are the non-parallel sides. We're just restating what we already talked about. The median of a trapezoid is the segment connecting the two midpoints of the legs. An isosceles trapezoid is a trapezoid which, who, which legs are the same length, okay? All that stuff we just talked about, they've just put it in a box here for you. But that leads us to a theorem, okay? And that theorem is 423 that tells us the median of a trapezoid is parallel to the bases and its length is half the sum of the length of the bases. So the first part is pretty easy to understand, right? This median of a trapezoid is parallel to the bases. So UT is parallel to MN, MN is parallel to RS, all that we can understand. But this last part, that its length is half the sum of the length of the bases, this is what it is represented by that. That the median is equal to one half the quantity of base one plus base two. So that would be if we knew the length of UT, we would add it to the length of RS and then take half of that sum. That's what is represented, this formula right here. Median equals one half of the quantity base one plus base two. That will be an important formula for us to remember moving forward. Page 91, we have another theorem, and that's theorem 424. It tells us that the base angles of an isosceles trapezoid, so that is its condition, it has to be an isosceles trapezoid, are equal. So that's telling us that if we have a trapezoid here and our legs are equal, so that has to be the case, right? AD has to be equal to BC, and it tells us that they are right here, that it's an isosceles trapezoid, then we know that angle one and angle two are equal because those are base angles. They are angles that touch a base. But we also know that this angle three and this angle four are equal because they are angles that touch a base. They are also base angles. Okay, and then they've got a long proof that shows you why that's true. But you know what? We're just going to say, got it. All right, let's turn the page. Now we have one last theorem that is in regards to isosceles trapezoids. And that tells us that the diagonals of an isosceles trapezoid are equal. So what we know then, since we have two diagonals, is that AC is equal to BD. Okay, and these aren't bisected or any of that jazz. They are just equal. So the whole length of this diagonal is equal to the whole length of that diagonal. Now, there aren't any proofs um, right now to do here regarding trapezoids, so yay. But there are some math problems, so let's take a look at those. All right, to finish up this book, I want to look at problems 65 through 68. And they, we are given this shape right here and asked a bunch of questions. Now, what we need to remember that the median is equal to one half the quantity of the base one plus the base two, okay? That's what we're working with here. So 65 tells us if RO equals 10, and I'm just gonna write them in lightly so that I can erase them each time, and ES equals six, then what is MN? Well, MN is our median in this case. So we know that it's going to be one half of 10 plus six. Okay, that's what this means. So if we add 10 and six, we get 16. One half of 16 is eight. So MN, and with these per, param, parameters, sorry, equals eight. So then, like I said, I'm just going to erase and do the next one. So the next one for 46 says that if RO equals X 
and ES equals Y, then what is MN? Now here's where I don't want you to get confused because as we move forward, they're gonna start putting these variables in instead of numbers, and a lot of people look at it like, uh, but we are just gonna substitute it in like we normally would. MN is still one half of base one plus base two. Now, we cannot combine these numbers because they aren't like numbers. So that ends our math problem. That's it, that is our answer. We can't go any farther than that. So don't let variables confuse you. They just wanna see that you understand, that you grasp the concept of the formula. And so we've substituted in the information that we've been given, and that's our answer. MN is equal to one half of X plus Y. Until they give us more information, that's it. We can't go any farther than that. Okay, so don't let variables confuse you when you see them. For 67, now this is on page 93. I hate when they do that, but that's where it is. If MN is 24, so now this is 24, and RO is 30, then what's ES? Okay, so here's how we have it now. I'm going to do the problem down here. So here I'll do 467. I'll do the work for it we're still gonna substitute in. MN is our median. So now we've got 24 is equal to one half. We have our base one, which is 30 plus base two. We don't know, that's the one we're looking for, right? Now I'm just writing base sub two, but you could write ES in here, that's the same thing. And now we need to solve. We're gonna distribute our one half through, well actually, you know what, I'm not gonna do it that way. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna multiply both sides by two. Because when I multiply by two, that will get rid of the fraction and then I don't have to worry about having a one half of base two, okay? So when I multiply by two, my twos cancel because two divided by two is just a one, right? And so I'm left with two times 24, which is 48, is equal to 30 plus base two. All right, parentheses drop and I'm just left with that. Now, just like algebra, we wanna get base two by itself. 30 is being added, so we're going to subtract 30 from both sides. Our base 2 is going to come down, and 48 minus 30 is 18, right? Those canceled, so we're left with 18. So what's our base 2? Our base 2 is 18. ES is 18, okay? Um, my 24 stays the same, but I'm going to erase that 30. So for 68, it says if MN is 24, again, let me double check that I wrote that correctly. All right. And our ES is 10, then what's RO? Very similar to the problem we just did. Let's do the math right here. Okay. MN is our median, so we know that it's our 24. 24 is equal to one half of, this time we don't have our base one, right? Although it really doesn't matter which one labels is labeled what and our ES is 10. Same problem, I'm gonna multiply both sides by two again. So I get 48 on one side is equal to, my twos cancel and I'm left with base one plus 10. Our 10's being added, we're going to do the opposite and subtract. My base one then is equal to 38. Okay, so we know that RO is equal to 38. So this is how we work through some of these problems. This median formula is very important. If it's not on your postulates and theorems page, because I haven't checked it, um, write it in. Now, one thing I want to note real quick, before we leave this book, you do not need to do this problem at the bottom of page 93. It goes on to the top of page 94, but no, no, you do not need to do this problem. It is, and it says to challenge your geometric ability. This problem will definitely challenge your geometric ability. It is extremely hard and therefore I do not feel the need to do it. No. Now, if you will feel like challenging your geometric ability because you're, you know, you're You've got a few minutes on a Saturday afternoon. You're like, hey, I feel like challenging my geometric ability. Huh, huh. Then go ahead and do it. Um, but you do not have to do it as part of your homework. It is not required. All right. So we're finished with this book, but let's take a look at book five. So in book five, we're starting on page two and we're reviewing some principles of algebra. And the first principle of algebra we're going to review is a ratio. Okay. 
And a ratio is basically a comparison of two numbers by division. The quotient, or this, is the ratio of the two numbers. This is 1 to 4. When we read it like this, when we write it, we read the division line as the word 2. 1, 2, 4. Okay, and it talks about that at the top of page 3. Okay, the ratio of 3 to 15 is 1 fifth because 3 to 15 reduces to 1 fifth. Okay, the ratio of 8 to 2 is 4 over 1. Now, we would, you could write that as the ratio of 8 to 2 is equal to 4 to 1, right? It's a 4 to 1 ratio, or you could just say 4. But most of the time, you're going to want to leave it in this form, even though that's not a normal math form that we like, but that is a ratio form that we like, okay? The of number is the numerator, or the top, and the to number is the denominator, or the bottom. Let's turn the page. What I want us to look at at the top of page four is this, that a ratio is simply a number. No units of measure, no units are connected to that number, okay? So when we write them, they can also be written, written, so write, written like this, okay? When we had that um, ratio of eight to two, right? It could also be written as like this, eight to two, but we still need to simplify it as four to one. All right, so there's a couple different ways that you can write the ratio. You can write it as a fraction, 4 to 1. You can write it like this, 4 to 1. Or you can write 4 to 1. All right, there's three different ways ratios can be written. Um, now, let's look at this model 5. And the reason I want to look at this one is because it has a ratio of three numbers together. It's a little slightly more complicated, but nothing we can't handle. It says the ratio of 3 to 4 to 5 can be written like this, 3 to 4 to 5, okay? You can't write it in a fraction form, unfortunately, because that would be weird. But this ratio means that the ratio of the first to the second number, okay, is 3 to 4. And the ratio of the second to the third is 4 to 5. And the ratio of the first to the third is 3 to 5. So we have to take that into consideration when we're looking at this. So it says the following sets of numbers all have the ratio 3 to 4 to 5, since they can be reduced to that ratio. So when we're looking at 12 and 16, they reduce to the 3 to 4. So they're the first two numbers, right? Then we look at the 16 and the 20, they reduce to the 4 to 5. But if we look at the first number and the last number, which is 12 to 20, 12 to 20, they reduce to the 3 to 5, okay? And that's the same for all three of these sets of numbers. But when we're talking about more than one, more than two numbers in a ratio, that's how we have to look at it. 3 to 4 to 5, that means when we take parts of the ratio, that's how they relate to each other. The first two parts relate in a 3 to 4. The second two parts relate to each other in a 4 to 5. The first and the third relate to each other in a 3 to 5 ratio. Okay, that being said, let's take a look at some of these problems. So the first ones that I want to look at are listed here. I want to look at 1, 2, 5, and 6, all right? And here they're asking us to express, express each ratio in its simplest form. So now we need to take a step back from our proof mind and just look at our math mind, okay? We need to reduce these fractions, basically, or reduce these ratios. So when we're looking at something that's 6 to 12, we know that 6 goes into both of those numbers. How many 6s are in 6? Well, there's 1. And how many 6s are in 12? There are 2. So this ratio is actually 1 to 2. Looking at 6 and 9, they both have a 3 in common. How many 3s are in 6? There are 2. And how many 3s are in 9? There are three, so this ratio has a two to three. It's a two to three ratio, okay? Number five, 21 to 28. Now we've got to think a little bit, but if we think, we can see that they both have seven in common as a factor. How many sevens are in 21? There are three. And how many sevens are in 28? There are four. So this is a three to four ratio. 
And number six, 25 to 45. Well, they both end in a five, so we're going to go with five, right? How many fives are in 25? There are five. And how many fives are in 45? There are five. Or, oh my gosh, there are not five. There are nine. There are nine fives in 45. So this is a five to nine ratio. All right, let's take a look at some more. For these next couple sections, they've given you numerical values for your ratios and they want you to list them. So for, I'm gonna do nine and 11 with you. The rest I'm gonna leave you to do on your own. I know you're gonna kill it, it's gonna be great. Um, if A equals three and B equals five, then what is the ratio of A to B? Well, it would be three to five. Since we can't reduce that ratio, that's it. It's just three to five. Number 11 now, and some of these other problems as you move forward, lists A over A plus B, or A2, A plus B. So let's do that. A, which is 3, 2, A plus B, or 3 plus 5. Well, that simplifies to 3 over 8. That cannot be reduced, so the ratio in this case is 3 to 8. So you're going to work through these problems um, with the information that they've given you. Make sure you reduce to your lowest um, ratio here because that's the answer that we're looking for. Great job. So now that we understand ratios, on page six, they're going to talk about proportions. And proportions are an equation that states that two ratios are equal. Okay, so the proportion A over A to B equals C to D tells us that the ratio of A to B and the ratio of C to D are equal ratios. Okay, that's what a proportion tells us. So each of the four numbers, A, B, C, D, is called a term in the proportion. All right, and the first and the fourth terms are known as the extremes. So if it was written like this, okay, Although here it's written, let's see, let me try and squeeze it in. A to B, and I know my A looks like a 9, I'm sorry, equals C to D, right? So the first and the fourth terms are known as the extremes. The first and the fourth, see how they're doing it there? That's the extremes. And the second and the third are called the means. The means and the extremes. Now if we wrote it like this, A to B equals C to D, okay, we still have the same thing. The extremes are still A and D. The means are still B and C. We just wrote it in a different way. That's fine. And then here they talk about an extended proportion. Remember when we had more than two variables and here we have more, right? It just keeps going on and on and on and on and on and on and on. Okay, one half is equal to two fourths or three sixths or four eighths or five tenths and so on and so forth, okay? And we can pick any of those ratios and form a regular proportion, right? 3 to 6 is equal to 6 to 12. 7 to 14 is equal to 2 to 4. They're all the same because they have the same ratio. All right, so since a proportion is an equation, we can use a proportion of equality to transform a proportion into another form. And how they did that was kind of weird. Okay, um, basically all they're doing here is cross multiplying, okay? They're taking their mean times their mean, and they got this, and they're taking their extreme times their extreme to get this. How they did, I mean, I understand how they did the math here, but it's kind of weird. They just took each of the de denominators and multiplied both sides by the denominators, by the common denominator, right? DB. And then they canceled here, they canceled their Bs, and they were left with AD. Here they canceled their Ds, and they were left with CB, right? But basically all you have to do is cross multiply. So when we're dealing with proportions, and proportions are just two ratios that are equal, we can cross multiply and to, get our, to help us solve for things. So let's take a look at some of these problems. So we're in book five, section one, page seven. And I'm looking at problems 131 and 132 to get us started. For 131, we're given that 3 to 4 is equal to 5 to 20. They want you to list the means and the extremes. 
Now, remember the extremes were the two on the outside, were the first and the fourth term. So our extremes are three and 20. That leaves our means, the two inside terms, right? If we have written them like this, three to four equals 15 to 20. And we feel free to rewrite it if it helps you to see it. But our two inside terms are our means, four and 15, all right? So let's do it again with number 32. Five to seven is equal to 20 to 28, right? So our outside ones, those are our extremes, or five to 28. And the inside ones are our means, or seven and 20, okay? So that's what you're gonna do for that first section. Now let's take a look at a couple of the actual math ones that are in the next section. All right, so looking at number 37, we've got x is to, or x to 25 is two to five, okay? And they want us to solve for x. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna cross multiply. And that tells us that five x is equal to two times 25, okay? Or that five x is equal to 50, Five is being multiplied by x. We're gonna do the opposite and divide. That cancels our five and our x is equal to 10. So we solved for x, okay? We cross multiplied, which gave us our five x times two, or is equal to two times 25. And then we just simply solve for x and we got x is equal to 10. Now in problem 42, they aren't set up like this. And so cross multiplying really isn't gonna work for us. But what is going to work for us is our means and our extremes. Because our means multiplied by each other are equal to our extremes multiplied by each other, okay? So we're going to take this or two thirds X and we're gonna set that equal to these two things are gonna be equal to one half times three fourths, all right? That's why they had you up here looking for your means and your extremes because it's the same thing. Now we could have done that here too, right? Because our means were five and X. It's exactly what we did. And our, our sorry, our extremes were five and X and our means were two and five. So we did the exact same thing. So now we need to solve this. So I hope you, are freshened up on your fractions, right? How do we multiply fractions? Well, we multiply the numerator times the numerator and the denominator times the denominator. So now we have 2 thirds x equals 3 eighths. To get rid of this 2 thirds, we're going to multiply by the reciprocal. And we, what we do on one side, we have to do on the other, so we're gonna multiply both sides. Here, they cancel out, right? Become a one, and that leaves us with our x. Here we can't cancel, we can't reduce, so we just have to multiply just like we did here. Numerator times numerator, three times three is nine. Denominator times denominator, eight times two is 16. This answer cannot be reduced. They don't have anything in common factor-wise. And so our answer for 42 is simply nine sixteenths. Okay, so whether it's written like this and you can simply cross multiply or you have it written like this and you're just going to take your means times each other equal to your extremes times each other. Either way, you should come up with the right answer. And so that's what you're going to do moving forward with those problems. Now I want to take a look at two more on the next page. The reason I want to look at these, because if you look at the top of page eight, and then we're on page eight here, section one of book five. 1005. They want us to use some more of our knowledge. It says, along with our knowledge of complementary and supplementary angles, ratios can help us solve geometric problems. Okay, and that's what we're looking at here with 51. Two complementary angles. What does that mean? We know that complementary angles equal 90 degrees, right? Two complementary angles have the measures in the ratio of one to five. So we have a ratio of one to five. Find the measure of each angle. Well, here's how we do it. We've got our one to five ratio, right? One times some number we don't know, 
plus five times some number we don't know is gonna equal our complementary or 90 degrees. And now we can solve this like an algebra problem. 1x plus 5x is 6x, so 6x equals 90 degrees. 6 is being multiplied, so we're going to do the opposite and divide. x then is going to be equal to 15 degrees. So we know that our 1x angle is 15 degrees. So what is our 5x angle? Well, it's 5 times 15, right? Or 75 degrees. So now we've solved our two complementary angles because we knew their ratio. So let's look at 152. Very similar. The ratio of the measure of two supplementary angles. Now, supplementary means what? Right, it means that they're equal to 180 degrees. So the ratio of two supplementary angles is 3 to 7. Find the measure of each angle. Well, we're just going to do it like we did the last one. So we know that 1 is 3 and 1 is 7. We don't know the angle's measurements yet, but that's what we're going to find out. We have a 3 to 7 ratio. So for every 3 of this x, we have 7 of this one. Together, they equal our 180 degrees. Okay, that's how you can think of it. For every 3 of these, we've got 7 of that. All right? Adding to them together, we get 10x is equal to 180. 10 is being multiplied by x. We're going to do the opposite and divide. Okay. And that leaves us with x equal to 18. Now, what is our 3x angle? Our 3x angle is 3 of these 18s for 54 degrees. And where we have 3 of those 18s, we also have 7 of those 18s or 126 degrees. So those are our two angles that together make 180 degrees. We knew that because they gave us a ratio. Okay, so as you work through the rest of these story problems, and I hope you'd notice there weren't any proofs, yay. Um, but as you work through the rest of these story problems, keep that in mind. We have a ratio, and you need to use that to your advantage when you're figuring out and setting up these story problems. Now, if it, you get to the point where you're like, oh my gosh, I'm not really sure I understand this story problem, please let me know, and I'd be happy to help you get it set up. And then you can solve it on your own, but I would be happy to help you get it set up so you can shoot me a text. Otherwise, you can meet me in my office hours if you have any questions. So that's our lesson for this week. Until next time.